This video has a bit of potential to be an exhibition in my obsessive neurosis, but I'm willing to do that. I'm willing to make that sacrifice uh, if it means that we can influence a broader conversation about the incarnation of Jesus and what it is that influences our perception of him for good or for ill. My hope for this video is that even if you like shows like The Chosen, which is fine, calm down, don't get mad yet. Even if you like shows like The Chosen, that this will help you ask the right kinds of questions so that your perception of Jesus is shaped by who he actually is, rather than maybe a figment of someone else's imagination. So a lot of people have been asking me, have you been watching The Chosen? What did you think of the last episode? And my reply is always the same, which is that I, I haven't watched it and I don't really intend to. Now that sounds harsh as if I'm prejudiced against the show. And for all I know, maybe, maybe I do have some blind prejudices, um, but it isn't meant to be a criticism of the show. Like I said, I haven't seen it, so I can't judge it based on its own merit. Um, and I wouldn't fault anyone, again, for watching it, but I can say why generally, as a rule, I'm a little bit wary of dramatic depictions of Jesus Christ and why that wariness has discouraged me from taking a specific look at The Chosen. And broadly speaking, the two big topics that inform that wariness uh, and my apprehension are related to Christology and to sacred art and how sacred art can inform our faith. And because these are such important topics to me uh, and my faith, and I would say for the church as well, we've bled a lot of ink over Christology and sacred art. Um, I think that the topic of the chosen is something that uh, can help us relate to these topics and have, again, an important conversation about them. So starting with Christology, if that's a term that you aren't familiar with, um, it's the study of who Jesus is and was and the nuances of the incarnation. Like how do the puzzle pieces of humanity and divinity fit together in a coherent way? The first thing I would want to emphasize about Christology based on my very limited experience of having studied it is that it's, extremely nuanced and very difficult to get right. In fact, it's what theologians and church fathers spent the majority of the first few centuries arguing and debating about and trying to resolve. And even once that theology was dogmatically defined through the course of um, synods and, and especially councils, ecumenical councils, um, you still had bishops and clergy and statesmen uh, getting it wrong and and not not articulating that theology accurately again even though it was dogmatically defined all of which is to say that it's very difficult to to get right and it requires a great deal of care um, which isn't to say that filmmakers don't feel the weight of that pressure when they try to depict the person of Jesus um, but it does mean that it's extremely easy to make mistakes and I would even go so far as to argue that the amount of detail that tends to emerge in dramatic depictions of Jesus is even greater than it is in our theology because it goes from being this sort of abstract intellectual concept to a, a full embodied depiction of those concepts. Again, that's extremely challenged. What we're talking about here is the perfect human and much more, but let's just let's just confine this conversation for a second to what the idea of a perfect human might be. This is someone who, who doesn't suffer any of the effects of our fallen nature, like shame, guilt, or insecurity. He would be completely without insecurity because that's an effect of being overly obsessed with ourselves and our shortcomings, which is something that Jesus wouldn't exhibit at all. But we also know that he was meek and humble. So you can't go too far in the other direction by portraying him as being obnoxiously confident uh, because that too is a mode of compensating for insecurity. So this raises so many difficult questions. What does that look like? How does someone with those kinds of qualities carry on a conversation? How does he talk? What are his mannerisms like? like think about the way that normal people like you or I conduct a conversation. We're always grasping for our turn to, to have our say, like trying to find those breaks in the conversation where we can wedge ourselves in there. We're always using strange inflections to compensate for our insecurities. Uh, we're always using filler words like um, so that people know that we're not done with our turn and they won't kind of wedge themselves in and, and, and take over when we, when we haven't finished. And we always struggle to organize our thoughts fast enough for verbal composition. But you might be thinking, Jesus was also human. He wasn't just God being portrayed for us or sort of an appearance of, of God in human form. He was fully God and fully human. 
So Jesus would have acted in many respects, just like us, right? Um, And this rationale is referenced all the time when people want to introduce some sort of dramatic innovation that just aren't recounted in the Gospels. I even saw a conversation on YouTube about The Chosen where they were defending a scene using this kind of rationale. Uh, In this scene, apparently Jesus was trying to rehearse and plan his speech for the Sermon of the Mount as if he wouldn't know what to say when the time came. My problem with this line of thinking is that it always smuggles in human brokenness with the idea of Christ's humanity. Yes, Jesus is fully human, but he wasn't a human being with a compromised nature the way the rest of us are. I don't think that he would uh, exhibit insecurities or certain kinds of ignorance. I don't think he'd be speculative or, or careless with his words the way the rest of us are. I don't think he would struggle to maintain eye contact or, or to mean what he says or to overuse his hands the way I am right now or get distracted by the judgments or the perceived judgments of others. But more importantly, Christ's preaching was a moment of revelation in which something we don't know, the knowledge of divinity, was being revealed to us. This is a critical moment in which he wants to tell us who God is and what he wants from us. That isn't something that I think Jesus would rely on his limited human knowledge for. In order to reveal divinity to us, he would have to rely on his divine knowledge. But if he has to write it out and practice it the way that someone like I would have to do, then that strongly infers that he either doesn't have or isn't using that unlimited divine knowledge, which is confusing, if not misleading. If I want to look at art, or especially sacred art, that depicts Jesus, I'm motivated by this desire to do what what Benedict XVI always implored us to do, which is to contemplate the face of Jesus, contemplate the incarnation of God, God made flesh. But If instead I'm distracted by novel interpretations that disregard or maybe is even ignorant of the mountains of theology that tell us what to look for when or or how to describe Jesus, um, or it just can't rise to the challenge of getting it all right, then I can't contemplate the face of Jesus. Instead, all I can do is contemplate a distraction from the real Jesus. It's almost as if to get it right, you'd have to be a living saint. You'd have to be so tuned in to what a vision of perfection is that you would know what to look for and what to not look for. And that's a tall order. I'm even tempted to say it's too tall an order. So that might raise uh, a misconception of what I'm trying to say. You might be thinking, does that mean that all depictions of sacred art and of the incarnation are best left undone? And I would say, no, that's definitely not what I'm saying. The thing about a painting or a sculpture is that it gives us a glimpse but it leaves a lot to the imagination of the viewer. It doesn't have to depict the words, the mannerisms, the presence of qualities or the lack of qualities that might suggest uh, something like an insecurity. But when you add video and sound, those demands become increasingly difficult to overcome. I will say, however, that that Jim Caviezel's portrayal in The Passion, which is Mel Gibson's movie, um, that really worked for me. And I think the reason for it is, in addition to just getting a lot of things right, uh, is the fact that they went with Aramaic for the language, as opposed to something more like English. Aramaic, again, being the, the vernacular that Jesus spoke. I think that made it feel immediately more authentic and less like an actor Uh, playing the role that you have to kind of see through in order to see the real person. Uh, It makes it harder for us to judge, too, when it's not your own language. It's a lot harder to detect and be distracted by some of the problems that I've been describing so far. Um, It's a lot more like a painting in that it leaves more to the imagination of the viewer and leaves room to encounter the real Jesus instead of a fully fleshed depiction based on someone else's vision. The other concern I'll mention just briefly is that the church's history with sacred art is one that is extremely fraught with controversy, and and some would argue for good reason, because nothing can shape our understanding quite like full-bodied imagery can. But that brings with it a risk. Prior to the incarnation of Jesus, God commanded the Israelites, uh, his chosen people, that they could not produce any depictions of him, um, probably because any attempt to do so would be wrong and more likely to provoke a reaction of idolatry than worship. An embodied depiction of God was something that was going to have to come on God's terms, and that's exactly what happened with the Incarnation. He chose when and how that the invisible, eternal creator would appear to us so that we could see him, touch him, and interact with him in a way that wouldn't melt our faces off. 
That's what the incarnation of Jesus means. And any attempt by us to reproduce God's depiction in the incarnation should take an incredible amount of caution and care, both so that we don't get it wrong, but also so that it doesn't create the wrong kind of reaction in in our target audience, our viewers, one that runs the risk of them apprehending God in a misleading way or a way that could lead to idolatry. And I know that some people will accuse me of being overly fastidious or obsessive, but I do think that this this kind of a conversation matters. Storytelling in film is so engrossing and so immersive that it can do much more to shape our perception of someone like Jesus than any theological commentary can. Now that I've been a Christian for some time, one of the things that I've noticed is that the maturation of my perception of Jesus has as much to do with correcting misconceptions that were formed by somebody else, maybe media, than it does about growing in knowledge. Now, as I said at the beginning, I've never seen The Chosen, so I can't say if it really falls into a lot of these these kinds of difficulties that I've been describing. Um, But from what little I know, it does seem that the producers are taking their role in depicting Jesus and the Gospels very seriously, which is something that I, for one, am grateful for, especially considering how much distorted content there is out there. So if you like The Chosen and it's helping you to grow closer to God, then I would say that's great. My only advice would be to make sure that you're being diligent about prayerfully finding other resources that will help shape that perception and your ideas about who Jesus is and what he's calling you to in this life as well. Thanks for watching. The reason I can continue making content like this is because of the generous support of my viewers. If you feel called to support this work, then consider joining the Reinforcements, which is my online community. There are multiple tiers, including free access for those who can't help financially, but still want to join. You can join up at www.brianholtworth.ca. Certain levels will also get a free gift basket from Glory and Shine, who is a family-owned Catholic bath and body products company, whose beard balm I'm wearing right now. It's like aromatherapy for your face. Even if you don't join, they make amazing products. So check them out at gloryandshine.com. And don't forget to like and subscribe. You don't have to agree with everything I said to get value out of these kinds of conversations. So be sure to subscribe to be edified or challenged. There's value in both.